So, um, so with that, the the whole purpose of tonight is for you all um, to share, you know, your impressions of lessons that you think either kids or coworkers or family members, um, you know, uh, lessons that you feel would would be would be helpful for them based on material, you know, materials that you've learned from the course. Um, yeah, there is no name for the conference yet, <laughs> and there is no information. Uh, that was uh, so we don't have more. But um, what what I'll make sure that we do is as soon as we know the 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 name and and have a place where you can find out more information, we'll email everybody from the course from you know and, and let you know because it is happening, right, Tammy? It's going to happen. We and we're not trying to keep information from you. It just it is seriously in the planning stages, and part of the situation is. Um, Lisa Wellman is doing a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to sponsors because she has a, that word senator in front of her name. And we find that carries a lot of weight and she's in the middle of a ledge session. So she's dancing as fast as she can and doing this as well. Yeah. And she's a remarkable person, right? Yes, she is. Okay. So, um, so I, I could, of course, call on people, but it would be better if people volunteered. Um, and there's there's no requirement that you, you know, get up in front of you, share your lesson. But what I found is that by sharing your lesson, you're really benefiting everybody else in the course. So, um, you know, because each one of us has learned something or gathered something a little bit different and applied it a little bit differently. And your perspective is going to be very valuable for everybody here and everybody watching the recording. So, um is there anybody who's going to volunteer to be the first person and get it out of the way and really feel great the whole rest of the evening? Uh, I, I will. Oh, fantastic. I want to get it out of the way. <laughs> okay. So let me just see if, um, are you, um, I'm gonna try to, yes, I'm going to see. Okay. So you're already a co-host. So do you want to share your screen or do you want me to, um, to oh, display sure. it and you can describe it? Um, let's see. I don't know. I'm not sure how. How do I do that? So there should be something on the bottom of the screen that says share screen. It's green as opposed oh. to every other color. All right. Hold on. Let me just pull up. I just realized I didn't pull up my thing. So let me do that really quick. And and if you want, like I just clicked on yours. So you know, I can, um, I can share it and you can just tell me when to advance. Okay. Um, I think I got it. Hold on. Let me see. Okay. Share screen. Yeah. That is pretty obvious. <laughs> share. All right. And you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go through exactly the way you would teach it to a kids. It's really, okay. ex really, it's, it's as much about explaining what what you want kids to know and how you you know uh a sum summarizing how you would go about using it for kids okay yes and um, doesn't this look awesome thank you um and so first just a little background so i have been out of the classroom for a while now um about 10 years probably because when we moved here i was teach i was continuing to work for the district with curriculum development um when until my first son was born then when he was about a year old I stopped doing that and he is now six so I'm trying to renew for my um you know renew my certificate um so I have not had a classroom in a long time and I was like should I do a hypothetical class and I was like you know I'm just gonna do it as if I was doing this with my four-year-old and my six-year-old because I might very well do that I think it'd be good for them so just that's just a little background um I'm trying to remember how to go in view uh slideshow up on the top right Got it. <laughs> okay so the topic i did was how can i handle um conflicts which as two little boys that are brothers that share a room <laughs> we have that a lot and then i put the nonviolent communication because that's what it really is but i don't know that i would necessarily use that word with them at that little age we just talk about conflict okay <laughs> so first thing is talk about what is conflict so has yours, um, 
is yours showing on your screen because on my screen it just says oh. loading oh yeah it is showing on my screen so you might need to unshare and then share. Okay. reshare it says new share yeah go back to share screen and 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 share again you see it now um what we see is um slide view which is actually fine Okay. You know, so you you probably just you can just click through the slides this way. Okay. So you see the one that's the two kids staring what, angrily at each other. And what? Yep. And what, what is, is conflict? conflict? Okay. Yep. So so there, just have them talk about conflict and give examples of what they think conflict is and what that looks like. Um, and then so our steps to help us is what do I see? What do I feel? What do I need? And what do I want to happen? So first we would do, what do I see? And so then uh, we are going to read a book and we are going to describe what we see when there is conflict. So the book that we would read is, is everybody ready for fun? Mm. I was having trouble scrounging for stuff in my library that had conflict that wasn't the book I used at the end. And they love this one because chicken is really mad all the time. So let me talk about what all of that looks like when chicken's mad at them for jumping on his sofa. Um, and so, and also, I don't think I would do this all in one sitting because for four and six year olds, this is too much. I would probably chunk it for each of the um, individual things because their attention span is quite short. I just realized I should clarify that. Um, so then when it was time to talk about what do I feel, we would read this book and we would talk about naming our feelings. And then when we talk about what do I need, um, my kindergartner, actually, they recently did this book and he thinks it's amazing. Mostly, I think, because he likes to clarify that when his brother says that he needs to share his Star Wars figures, it's really a want. And he, I think he <laughs> feels very empowered to know the difference. But so we would review the difference between needs and wants to give them that those words for name. Um and then what do I want to happen? Whoops. And then we would read Five Little Monkeys Jumping on the Bed. Talk about what did the mama want? Um, and so then like the final thing to bring it all together is we would do the recess queen. Um, and so we would read up to the part where before Katie Sue comes. And then we would talk about what is the conflict that you see? What do you think the kids are feeling? What do you think the kids need? And then what do you think the kids want to have happen? Hmm. And then we would finish the book and talk about what Katie Sue did to resolve that conflict, which doesn't really follow nonviolent communication, but it's, hmm. it's sweet and cute. And then go back over, how can I handle conflicts? What do I see? What do I feel? What do I need? What do I wow. want? Wow. Well, that really puts nonviolent communications in a format that really could engage kids. And, you know, since it's the idea behind it is really adult to adult. And this really makes it something that uh, walks kids through that whole process. Well, thank you. It was kind of fun. I hadn't done a <laughs> lot of stuff in a long time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, Tammy, any? No, uh, you know what I love though about it is the the age level is so amazing, right? I I mean I love it how because I get so many people going, you know what? We can't, you know, the kids are too young to understand. It's like no, no. Anybody who's raised children knows this is inherently conflict is inherent. It, you know. She got, I, oh my God, she's breathing my air. I remember that was one of my favorites in our <laughs> car, right? Or, or her snow, her, you know, you can imagine I have 11 siblings. Um, Her <laughs> ice cream cone is bigger than mine. Uh, my husband used to say this and I used to crack up, but like, no, I filled these by, by um mass, not, not by volume, you know, like what they put on the cereal. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> when did I become this person? But it's beautifully done. Laura, beautifully, beautifully <laughs> done. And I love your graphics too. Thank you. Just trying Thank to do visuals for the little. 
Yeah, because like you said, every kid understands that. Yeah. It's yeah. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch, for letting me have something to say. <laughs> Anybody else want to unmute or or say anything, or we can move on to the next person who's willing to present. I just want to say I, I can I love how you brought the literature and I put that in the chat. Um, but it is one of my favorite things to do. Like I work a lot with school leaders and teachers, but I still do read alouds and oftentimes I use children's books with adults. <laughs> um, but I could the way like you talked about you could chunk it and I was thinking a kindergarten teacher could do that in like one book in morning meeting and then like build a, a chart with the four book covers. Like I just I thought it was so transferable. It's beautiful. Thank you. Well, I was a teacher librarian for eight years at elementary school. So <laughs> that's I was I had, I had I was curious. Books. I had oh, these books. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a fantastic start. So yeah. who would like to should and you know, so I'm thinking, you know, Teresa, since you're going after a completely different audience. Would you mind sharing yours? Sure. I'm happy to share mine. Um, so mine is not in like slide ready format and I can explain to you kind of why. So mine is much more of like a facilitator guide. <laughs> um, and so I guess if you were thinking about it, it would look like a lesson plan. Um, but let me just, oh, I can't share my screen though. Oh, much. I'm so sorry. Uh, no, no me, worries. Um, now I have to find you. Uh, there it is, and make you a co-host. Perfect. Okay. There. So, don't expect it to be pretty, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk you kind of through my thinking on it. And so I focused on the Thomas Kilman conflict model activity, um, and I kind of had these are the learning objectives for my learners. But I kind of had in mind one of the design elements I like to use is both covert and overt um, intent behind the learning design. And I can explain that a little more after I talk you through what the activity would be. Um, and so it, imagine this is a professional development session and this could, I kind of left it loose enough that you could modify it for school leaders or teachers. Um, depending on your audience. And so uh, just thinking kind of along those lines, it's kind of a uh, take the facilitator guide and make it make sense for your group. Um, and I'll just annotate verbally like what I would normally really do in a session. But imagining that they are seated in groups of five already at a table. Um, so there's several groups of five around my room. And that's just based on convenience because there's five modes. So first I would start with direct instruction, kind of introducing the idea of what we're about to explore. Um, and there's just a little bit of text in here. I just grabbed Mitch's um, graphic for, uh, and credited him for ease of like your transfer as I explain it to you. Um, and I would spend a little bit of time kind of talking about what the, the literature is saying about what is compete, what is avoid, what are the five models. Uh, but a lot of the time for this activity would be them exploring. And so what I did was I went out and found five different resources. Um, and so the overt part is like, hey, go learn about this model. Take these five resources. There's five people at your table. Choose between them. Some of them are written. Some of them are videos. Choose each person choose one research. You can divvy them up however you want. So if someone wants a video, they can watch the video. What I am doing overtly or covertly is really trying to set them up to have to have a negotiation. Um, and so kind of a very mild conflict where they are going, what they're going to do, I'm going to give them time by themselves to explore their resource take some notes. And so I want them to think about this is their reading with a question in mind. How would you summarize this mode of conflict? When is the mode useful or a strong approach? When is it harmful or a weaker approach? Um, and just a note for anybody who wants to grab and use this, uh, that they 
all the five resources are not all 10 minutes long, but I'm trying to allow for some flexibility for processing time, note taking, synthesis. But if you have someone, a learner who's like, what am I supposed to do now? They can they can explore another resource and that's acceptable use of their time. Um, so in the middle of their tables, they will have a big piece of chart paper. They've been taking their own set of notes, but in the middle of their table, they're gonna have a big piece of paper. So after the 10 minutes, I'll tell them, your next set of instructions is each person now has to provide a synthesis of what their article or video, what their resource said and how it explained the five modes um, of conflict. And so everybody, all five people have to share the perspective from their resource. So now they have the perspective of their resource and they've synthesized it through their own lens. Um, so hopefully there's kind of layers of complexity in the perspectives, um, but also some good cognitive dissonance should come out of this conversation. As each person shares, everybody else is kind of taking their own notes, but they're doing it on the big chart paper in the middle of the table. And so now they're kind of using a shared space, noting what stands out to them. Um, and we oftentimes, I will put the resources on a Google site, you could put them on a slide, as long as they have access to them. And sometimes if I'm face to face, I'll have paper copies in case people mm -hmm. want to like highlight, annotate, et cetera. Um, so they have them on the big chart paper. And once they've all shared, then their next prompt is to synthesize based on the, the notes they've taken together. And so they're going to discuss these two new questions, which is how my understanding of these models help to understand your behavior as you navigate a conflict situation. And then how might understanding the models help you to understand and respond to the behaviors of others, teachers, students, et cetera. Um, and I think these two could really be modified to whatever your learning objective is or whoever you're sharing with. So if you know you're working with a group of teachers that are struggling in PLCs, then you can make that prompt more specific. Um, this is the time where I would give them a robust amount of time to have this conversation because this is where I really anticipate them hitting some dissonance, like thinking about how they understood it, what they heard other people understand, what other people wrote. Um, I would give them lots of time and space to have this discussion. And so if this was virtual, I would toss them in a breakout room and let them have the discussion. Um, and if I'm facilitating, I'm going to walk around and kind of listen for the nuggets that really stand out as themes. But then I am going to facilitate a whole group share out. Um, this part I do differently depending on the group and my thinking and what I heard. But... I like to kind of try to synthesize what they're doing live onto the front of the room. So then I can reflect back and make sure we're kind of coming to a common understanding. So this is my miniature formative assessment to see kind of how did the, how did the activity work? What is the understanding? Where are the gaps? Um, and then I would push them to really think about what are some of the things they might see here or notice if a student or colleague is in a specific conflict mode. Um, so getting them to start thinking about, okay, I'm gonna go back to class or to my PLC or to my faculty meeting, and how am I going to recognize this happening? Then I would give them a little bit of time to reflect for themselves. Um, this, For me, this reflection is purposefully thinking about kind of you read it, did anything change in what you're going to do or believe? So like the head, heart, hand reflection of what do you think this is gonna change? Did it change anything in your thinking? Is it changed anything in your beliefs? Or is it gonna change anything about how you're going to act? Um, so try to go through it quickly enough to, to give you time, um, but and happy how, to answer questions. How long do you think that whole process takes? I'd say about, if I were facilitating, I'd give it 45 minutes. Okay. Um, for so, robust time, for some dissonance, discussion, mm -hmm. and then an, the second round of synthesis. Yeah, because when you were going through it, I was A, thinking, wow, this would be so cool for a, a faculty meeting or for a PLC. And then the other thing is that uh, my wife and I belong to a sustainability, I guess, 
it's not really a club, but it's 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 a committee of of our village, and this would be a really good team building activity because we do get involved in a whole bunch of conflicts, and people take different styles and without even realizing it. And this would, uh, we you know we could facilitate this, and this would get people to be a lot more conscious of what they're doing in a conflict, not just you know, that this person is wrong. I thought that's great. I thought it was great. Thank you. But that's why, that's why you're a coach. You coach all over, all, all over the country, right? Yeah, it definitely shows, right? That you not only own that, but you work with other people to make them experts in their own right. So nicely done. Yeah, thank you. So, who wants to go next? I can. Okay, that would be great. Did I make you? Um, I think so. Yes, your co-host, so you can share. Giving me a weird option, so let's see. Oh, goodness. It's, hang on a second, it's giving, making me... Um, Update my permissions on my computer. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to have to log out and log back in if somebody else wants to go first. Okay, I or I could um, uh, I could access the Nearpod, I believe. Let me just because that's the that's the main uh, let's see if I can join the lesson. Okay, so I'm in the lesson. Do you want me to just share my screen? Okay, and then you just tell me what to do. Okay. I, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, I teach high school math, um, and one of my big um, ideas in my classroom that I, I try to get across to my students is that the idea of problem solving extends outside of just math kind of so that this idea of conflict really kind of hit home with me because um, I really want them to learn how to address conflict kind of as a future ready skill going out of the classroom and I work with mostly seniors so having come to me especially this group of seniors having spent the majority of their high school life either online for um virtual learning or on social media and stuff like that. I wanted them to see how to actually have a conversation with somebody as they leave high school that is productive um, and how to solve it. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. So the first thing I did was I kind of just showed them this little clip from Despicable Me where um, one of the sister's toy gets broken and she kind of blows up and um, the response was to kind of go after somebody, this idea of revenge or vendetta, and that's not productive. That's not where we want to go. Um, so that's kind of like my little hook into this idea of conflict. And then you can skip, I think, two slides ahead. Um, it takes them, it's going to make you watch videos. That's the problem with that. So the PDF might be a little bit easier because that it'll cut um, out the interactive stuff. Uh, um, I can't, I can't advance the video. Yeah, it's not going to let well, you wa do it without watching. And I and I don't even think I have sound on. So let me no. stop share. Okay, sorry share. about that. That's okay. No, no, no. It's my it's my problem. And then so there's the video. That's freaking me out. What is she doing? She's gonna hold her breath. I just posted the teacher preview link in the chat. If anybody wanted to like look that up. Boy, now stop it. <laughs> there are several videos in it oh so, okay so so yeah, okay so the teacher let me uh sorry let me um i'm in this spreadsheet and the third link i believe should so tell be me PDF. more mm -hmm. so it's just a pdf so it kind of tells you so okay. if you've ever downloaded an earpod before it tells you where the interactive pieces are to it so this is helpful if you've never used one and it kind of tells you like what's expected. So I have them watch a little video about conflict. We try to do very, very short videos, but we have a large population of English language learners. So we like to do videos that have translations accessible to them. 
So, but most of this video talks about conflict as a negative. So one of the things we do is we watch the video and then we had kind of have a, just an open conversation about it. And then if you go down a little bit further to slide five, I think, this is where I introduce them to, well, we have bad conflict. That's kind of our forest that's on fire idea, right? They're very, they're very, very used to hearing about those things. They don't often hear about conflict as being a good thing, as being something that is productive, as a, that challenge that we want to get through. And so I kind of wanted to highlight that. And then so on the next slide, what I've given them is a collaborate board. And they have the opportunity to list experiences where they've had bad conflict and this will be anonymous but they can see each other's they also have the opportunity to list things that could potentially be good types of conflict so that productive struggle that we experience in a learning environment um if you're in a relationship with somebody that conflict that you build off of that once you work through it it doesn't have to be the end of everything right so kind of focusing on those things so we go down further and I actually pulled some of uh, your ideas, but I tried to stick with ones that they would be um, most familiar with. So ideas of good conflict, kind of hoping to see some aha moments with them. And then some further ideas of bad conflict, which hopefully they will have already kind of come up with in that collaborate board. Mm -hmm. And then we go further. Um, and so here's our conflict styles, the five conflict styles. Um, and it's in the idea of animals. So it's just a cute little like two and a half minute video uh, that I've snipped from a much longer one. And it's kind of to have them see like, oh, what thing resonates with them? The idea actually came to me from something that I went to like a PD that was like, which animal do you feel like mm -hmm. today? And you're like, what? And you have to think about the personalities of animals. Um, but I find that even as seniors, when we can step back into that humorous um, idea of that childlike moment, they really enjoy that 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 break from all of the stress that they're feeling. So um, I like doing that. And then on the next one, I'm actually having them go and take that 30 question conflict survey to see kind of where they are. I found out that I am an avoid person as well as the... Um, What's the one where I try to be the mediator, which I never thought I would be because I'm so much more avoid that I just would rather not try to mm -hmm. mediate. Jeez. But on what? the next slide, after they do that, they have the op opportunity to do an open ended where they tell me and just me what they learned from that survey, how they feel about it. And then they do a poll that the whole class can see where they select which one or two styles they are so that the kind of the whole class can see oh well maybe we do have some things in common or maybe it's the idea of oh that person is a voider and i'm a this and maybe we don't want to have that fighter fight with each other or maybe we want to learn how to kind of bridge those gaps between those two conflict styles so after that we go through that's past the poll so there's their five options. So after that, we hit this like, whoa, so now what do we do? We have all these different conflict styles. We maybe have not ever learned how to deal with conflict in a productive way. Here's the game changer. We're going to learn about motivational interviewing. So how to actually talk to somebody, because we all know that if all they ever do is talk via social media or text message, they're never going to get along with anybody because you lose so much personality um, and humility in those conversations, right? So kind of how do we do that? So we talked about, we talk about what is an open-ended question. And then on the next slide, there are some um, examples of those. And then your resource only talked about reflective listening, but in order to define reflective listening, we also needed to define active listening. And active listening doesn't work if you can't put your phone down. And so that was one of the places I wanted to start with them as like, so like how many times is it you got your phone in your face and somebody is trying to talk to you and they get mad at you because you're saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, it, it happens. I do it too, but we need to kind of start there once we figured out what active listening is. Then there's a video that kind of ex explains them the reflective listening piece. Um, and then they kind of have an idea of, what is ho hopefully behind getting through um, a better communication method than that what they have been doing. And that's my goal is getting them ready to exit high school and not lose their jobs or lose their relationships because they can't effectively communicate with people.
So that's it. And then there's a little video that was a Disney short that was about two animals trying to cross a bridge and they like just kept bumping into each other because they couldn't work together to get around each other. And then they have an opportunity to just reflect on the lesson because we do a lot of reflecting in our class. That's it. So basically what you did is you took the highlights of this course, you dramatically improved them and you adapted them for high school kids. Pretty incredible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. How long do you think that, uh, that this will take? It's probably more than one class period, right? So we have 90 minute class periods uh, at my school. Mm -hmm. I could probably get through it in a 90 <laughs> minute. If I had a class that really wasn't wanting to participate, I could probably get through it in much less. But my seniors that I have experienced, when they get into a topic, when they find that right hook, when they find what it's what they're gonna get out of it and they finally start kind of believing in the idea of the lesson they're willing to participate and they're willing to have those meaningful conversations. So I feel like this is one that I could actually take to one of my classes tomorrow mm -hmm. and deliver and use the entire 90 minutes and feel like we've gotten something out of it. Well, if, if you do do this with a class, mm -hmm. it would be, could you just do me a favor and let me know how it went? Cause my guess is this could be like life changing for kids. This is yeah, really incredible. I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, we end a, uh, we're in a big unit module right now that we'll be in up until spring break. But right after we come from spring break is kind of when senioritis starts to kick in. And so mm -hmm. I'm thinking right after we come back from spring break, when we start our very last unit of the year, it would be a perfect time to to touch on this and make sure that we're not letting our stresses overrule us and we're communicating our needs because they will be increasingly pushy with their needs mm -hmm. <laughs> as we get closer to graduation. Fantastic. I'm going to stop the share. Okay, buddy. I'm, I'm sorry. My, my house is going crazy. The doorbell just keeps ringing. Um, and I've never been this popular in my life, so I'm sorry. Um, but what I caught of it, I just wanted to say my favorite part. And as soon as I heard it, I thought, oh, that resonates with me is positive conflict. There's no way to get out of conflict in our life. And, and in fact, I was having a meeting with somebody today and he goes, yeah, they hate conflict. And I'm like, well, who like Yes. Wait and a minute. I thought if you married the right person, there's never any conflicts. You know what? If you walk, yeah, I thought that too. Um, <laughs> I also I have um, 11 siblings that can assure you, I, they will tell you that it's just the way it is, right? And how right. you deal with things is just powerful. So I loved it when you said, you know, positive conflict. And I'm thinking, yeah, because, you know, let's be honest, progress gets made when we have conflict. I mean, we may not love it, but in order to move through it, it, it requires you to be able to manage that conflict. And it was, it, I mean, well done. Okay. For, thank you for allowing me to thank you. have a life thank here. You. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm uh, blown away by all, by all three. Um, so thank you everybody. So um, any other comments or should we move on to, Another lesson. Okay, who who wants to go next? You know, Mitch, I'm gonna say this again. I know you said it at the beginning, but it's with the sharing comes. Like I'm gonna be honest with you. Every time we do this, I just go, oh, and, and I learn so much when you guys share. So I appreciate that you're willing to share. I mean, it's you know, it's just that we all learn so much, or at least I do. Maybe I'm the only one, Mitch. But this is just I do. I, I yeah, do. I do every time. Well, I could go if no one else is uh, jumping up. Ah, okay. okay. And are you, did I make you a um, co-host? I don't think Not so. Not yet. Not yet. yet. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Also, um, I apologize if my heat goes on in the middle of everything. Um, I, uh, it's kind of, I've, I've been told that it's not super noisy. It's noisy on my end, but I don't think it is on, mm -hmm. um, anyone else's okay hold on a second well sarah as long as it's not your doorbell ringing <laughs> okay uh actually, you know my father used to say stupid stuff like you had all day to ring the doorbell i was here not like nothing happened and the minute i get on a workshop the doorbell rings 
And I used to think he was so silly for saying things like that, but now I'm thinking he was wise. Because every time the doorbell goes off, I'm just like, are you serious? Are you kidding me? So, yeah, Sarah, so your heater can go off. That's great. No <laughs> okay. That. Hold on. Let me close some of my other windows because it's not recognizing. Okay. Um. Let's see. Chrome, is it going here? Hopefully it's this one. Oh, oh it says allow Zoom, open system preferences. Okay. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. I might have to do something on my end before okay, I or sharing, so I can, I'll let someone else go. I, I can um, pull it up. Mine's kind of a complicated, oh. I made it complicated. Okay. <laughs> to, okay. All right. So yeah. Okay. I'll let someone else back. go. Okay. okay. Cool. This is Christy Shoemaker. I can do mine. Okay, Christy. And uh, did I make you a co-host yet? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I didn't. So okay. there we go. Now you're a co-host. Okay. Let me see if I can get in here and share. Okay. Can you see mine? It's uh, right now I have a dark screen that says you started sharing, but nothing. Yes, there, there it is. Okay. Yep. Okay, so I am a um, middle school teacher, eighth grade, and the one that I did, oh, now it says share conflict, and I don't know if this is going to work or not. Can you see my slides? Um, you know something, it's in the view that has the stuff on the left and the slides, but that's fine okay. for us. I can I can do this here. Okay, there we go. Oh, wow. So okay. is that good? Can yep, you guys that's... see it now? Okay. So mine is, um, I would teach this lesson a little bit before we worked in groups and I would let them know, I think it's really important to let kids know what it shouldn't look like. And so we would go over conflict styles, compete versus compromise. And we would go over, um, so let me see here. So the compete, um, I would give them just a definition. This style involves pursuing one's own. Um, let me see here. I'm going to see if I can move this stuff around because I can't see the whole screen here. Um, and just talk to them about what that means for the compete kind of conflict style. And then I would, I would talk about, give them a scenario and talk, talk to them pretty much like a role play where they've got four people, they've got a project. Um, how can you solve this problem if you use compete style conflict? and ask them, you know, how is that gonna work out if you both want to do the same portions of the project, um, like with somebody else and you're both competing for it, how is the problem gonna be solved? And I'm hoping that they're gonna get nowhere with that answer or that it's gonna be very, very difficult. And then I would go to the, um, the compromise style and give them the definition of that and talk about how, um, you know, your say, my say, and then how do you compromise and give them some ideas and have them kind of brainstorm. I, I don't have a lot of time uh, to do these kind of lessons. So what I like to do before I do a unit where they work together, I kind of like to give them the expectation of how they should act with each other, how, and I think if we did this first and then have them come up with the expectation of how they should compromise or not compromise and how they should look at other people's views and and how they should come together on a, on a group project. And then I would give them an, another scenario if they're working with a group of uh, another four people and it's a community project, how would they brainstorm um, a whole bunch of uh, you know great ideas and how would they come together for getting down to one great idea? And how would they do that using the compromise style of conflict? And then I would just talk to them about you know back and forth is there ever a time when the compete style conflict needs to be used how does that work what would that look like what scenario would you ever use that that style of conflict and then is there ever a time when the compromise style of conflict needs to be used because and and i would hope and they wouldn't be able to really um the compete style conflict i would hope they'd probably bring up like a parent child scenario maybe or something like that but being not being a parent, they probably wouldn't understand that. But maybe there are some times that they would have an opportunity to have the compete style conflict. Like maybe if they're the leader of a sports team or a captain, or maybe they're the ASB president, they still have to listen to other people. But in the end, 
do they have to make that decision on their own? And is there is sometimes do they have to pick their own ideas or or perceptions? Right. Or maybe it's an emergency and people need yeah. to do something quickly. Yeah, that's right. So that's that's all. That's all for me. Wow. So it was so cool the way you, you know, you drew the kids in quickly. OK. And I could really see this as a way of getting the kids to to um, to come up with a way for for everybody, you know, for rules of engagement for a classroom and how everybody's going to be treating each other. I try to get that into my classroom. I really try to make sure that uh -huh. the kids are um, purposefully polite and respectful. But if it's not taught, especially I know as teachers, if it's not taught in the home, they come to school and we expect that every home life is this, you know, going to be able to come in and, and, and that they've taught those kids that. But we as teachers have to expect that, but we have to teach that expectation as well. Mm -hmm. How are they going to meet that expectation? And conflict is huge in the classroom. Well, we never, I, we never yeah. had any conflicts in my classroom. So, <laughs> right. oh, and you know what I love about it is we did too. And I remember at the time thinking, you're right. We need to teach kids. Okay, here, here's what to expect when we have conflict, and these are the rules of of engagement, right? Mm -hmm. And what I love is when you go through that calmly, in, in the way that you just did right what happens is now when they're in the heat of battle what i call the, the heat of battle in eighth grade middle school right <laughs> they if they could even take a second and pause they could make a choice right but if they don't know what the choices are or even how to engage in what we call fair and what i love is when you right back there when you said what would you consider you know fair and reasonable to or whatever word you use i'm sorry um right every kid knows how they want to be treated ar around these around these ideals so yeah excellent job thank you yeah thanks mitch for let me cut in by the way your comments are great so always feel you can cut in you know mitch i should is this being recorded for my husband yes yes okay i'm just checking okay So yeah, Christy, Kristen, yeah, really, really well done. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah, you're back. I'm back. Okay. It's oh, supposedly but you probably is all updated. right, but you probably aren't a, um, a co-host anymore. So I have to make you a co-host. Also, my heat just turned on, so I'm sorry if it's like whiny sound. No, I don't. <gasps> there we go. The only whiny sound I hear here is Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Can we all, can you all see that going to space? Okay, cool. Yes. Oh awesome. my God. I love the theme. I got <laughs> quiet. Sorry. <laughs> all right. So um, my presentation is primarily around conflict resolution, the conflict resolution framework that we have within our company, Comet Cadets. But before I dive in, I just want to give you like the teeniest, teeniest sneak peek as to what Comet Cadets is. So Comet Cadets is a framework for social emotional learning. Um, it all revolves around emotion identification, regulation, conflict, conflict resolution, all the good stuff. Um, Comet stands for communication and emotion training. So com E T Comet. Um, and it primarily focuses around our space captain here named Cap and her robot sidekick named Chip who doesn't understand their feelings yet. And so they go on missions um, and it mixes real space science with kind of a fictional twist on it. So they've discovered dark energy across the universe, which is like real life, the expansion of the universe. In Comet Cadets, dark energy is pushing everything and everyone farther apart. And they've discovered that um, dark energy is created by people when they don't understand themselves or each other. And so it pushes them farther apart, thus creating conflict. And so um, at Comet Cadets, they need a force to bring people back together. And that's where we go to space. So space is our like primary tool for conflict resolution. And um, space is a five-step process. Uh, that kind of outlines and walks you through step by step how to identify what happened, your feelings, your needs, um, and how to move on from there. So there are two types of space. There's inner space, which is where you go if you have an internal 
conflict. And then there's outer space where you go if you have an interpersonal conflict, so two or more people. We'll quickly run through both of them, but we'll start with inner space. Um, so there are five steps to each. So the first step of inner space is S, state what happened. Um, and with state what happened, you objectively look at the situation and you ask yourself what happened. So this is like without judgment, without blame, like looking at just the facts, trying to kick opinions out and just look at the facts. And some of the questions that you can use to help you through that process are like, what actions did I see or what words did I hear or who was involved? And then once you have like an objective view on it, then you can go to step two, which is place your feelings. And placing your feelings, we have a whole nother tool, which I didn't include in here, but we have our mood moon, where which helps you identify like the different um, like physical sensations in your body that are connected to emotions. Um, but here you can ask yourself, like, how do I feel? And you can think about the pleasantness and the energy of your emotion and be able to place your feeling. And then you go to step three, which is add your needs because all needs come from a feeling. And so you might be feeling something because a need is met or because a need is not met. And so you ask yourself, what do I need? And this ties back um, to like what Laura was saying earlier about those universal basic needs. So like some needs are things like food, water, shelter, but we also have needs like honesty and understanding and autonomy and all those more abstract needs um, that we all share. And then um, for inner space at C, you center yourself. So sometimes like you need a break. So you ask yourself, do I need a break? Do I need to reset? And if you do, you go to your space station, which is another tool we have for like, it's, it's basically a calm down corner with different, um, different strategies to help calm yourself down. Um, and the important piece here is like to basically get yourself out of that limbic mode. So before you can actually decide what you want to do around the situation, you have to be in a, a state of mind where you are able to effectively do that. So you need to center yourself. And after you feel calm, then you can end with a plan. And with this, you kind of reflect back on the situation and the feeling and the need that you may or may not have gotten met and come up with a new plan to be able to get that need met based off of everything that happened before. So it's probably going to look different. You might have to like take a few steps back and try a new path. Um, and then, of course, yeah, you ask yourself, what can I do now? And then all together, it spells out space very cleanly, mm. very nice. Um, and then outer space is, again, for interpersonal conflict. This one will go through even faster <laughs> because this is really just like a quick overview. Mm. Um, but it starts with actually the same three steps because conflicts, whether it's internal or interpersonal, you still need to identify those like primary pieces. So you start with state what happened. Um, and this is with two or more people. So it can be more challenging to look at it objectively and kick those opinions out and the judgment and blame out because you have multiple parties who are having to agree on what the facts are. Like what were, what did we see? What did we hear? Who was involved? And so it takes a little bit more work sometimes to get people to agree on literally what happened. Um, then all parties involved would still place their feelings. They can use the mood moon or they can use other emotional or emotion um, tools that they have to identify their feelings. But it's important that both people place their feelings and that feelings may be different even if they encountered the same situation. Um, and then that also leads again to their needs. And um, since we all have the same needs, this is also a step that really builds empathy and compassion because if someone is voicing um, like, hey, I have this need, the other person may have that need too in that situation or a different situation, but be able to understand where that person is coming from and then be able to like perhaps see the situation from their point of view a little bit more clearly and be able to have more empathy throughout the rest of the problem solving. Um, so what do we both need? So both people need to state their needs here. And they might be the same need, they might be different needs. Um, and then C is different. 
because it involves multiple people. So this is where you really have to communicate both people's feelings and needs and really like reassure that you are actually understanding what each person is saying. So this is tying back to, oh gosh, who was it that was talking about active listening? And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's that. So you want to make sure that like you are actually understanding what the other person was saying and internalizing that. And then um, both inner and outer space, you end with a plan. So what can we do now that everything has happened? How can we move forward? And again, this one also spells out space, but the C is different. So that's the only difference. Um, we have a few resources also that um, show these different spaces. So we have posters of inner space and outer space just to have like a real clean, sleek, like visual for everything. Um, and just like someone was saying earlier of like chunking each of these steps out, I think it was in Laura's presentation saying you could really spend like a full, you know, session on just one of those steps. That's one of the things that we develop. So within Comet Cadets, you go on missions and each mission is um, specific around a very, yeah. or like based on a specific skill. And then you earn a patch for your like mission completion. Mm -hmm. um, but our missions, like there are different missions for each step of space. So fact finder is all about learning how to objectively look at a situation or emotion explorer is all about identifying feelings. Um, and then just for fun, I threw in uh, our music album that we created that um, has songs also that touch on each of these steps of space. So like, um, you know, place your feeling. We have our song, How Do You Feel, addresses that directly. Or what do you need? The need I need is our song that like totally talks about needs. Um, and then the last thing that I put in here for if anyone was curious of like engaging into the world of Comet Cadets, this is um, like you've received an emergency transmission and it's kind of your hook into the whole world. And the storyline is Cap has crash landed and needs help because chip's emotion processor went out of whack when they flew through a space storm and so it's a whole mm -hmm. completely digital experience for the cadets to be able to um, engage in the world of comet cadets before beginning their like onboarding and going on their missions and everything um and that's that's the end the very last slide also has some resources if if anybody wanted to click through the slides and check out like that reboot chip um activity or onboarding or missions or anything mm. um but that's all of it yeah i know i come in with like a little bit of a different angle because we are developing material um versus me actively being in a classroom but i just wanted to give a little sneak peek into everything oh i mean first of all what engaging graphics thank you <laughs> so cool that kids get to feel that they're in a story as they're learning all of these you know, emotional intelligence techniques. And in this case, a combination of both NVC, you know, nonviolent communications and motivational interviewing. And it's just like amazing seeing how many pedagogic techniques you just folded in to all, you know, to the. Thank uh, you. To the, it's just like, uh, congratulations. Thank you. It's, um, it's been a real joy to develop, but yeah, we're excited. Okay, yeah, you know, and... having worked at NASA, Mitch, first of all, the minute you say space, you have my attention. And I'll tell you something I know, you have the attention of every kid in and out there. Yeah. You know, you know it doesn't matter. The second, <laughs> I don't know, Mitch, making games to teach this stuff. That's right. Kids shouldn't oh, be yeah. having fun. They should be learning, right? I, I mean... am just going <laughs> to, well, because Mitch knows this is my doctoral work, using games to teach. And the minute you're like, oh, and then, and they can go on missions and they can do that. And I'm like... Oh my, okay. So that's all I got. I Yeah, it, just to just give you a smile. sneak peek on their reboot chip. Can you still see yep. this? Yep. Okay, great. I see so if you, if you reboot chip, I won't play the video, but like Cap has crash landed and everything. And then you have to go, you go in here to help reboot chip's emotion processor. And it like gives you a reboot code and it's like super gamified. Yeah. Um, it's amazing and then, yeah and then you send it yeah. back and you get like your little update and everything my uh, other favorite thing that you um, kept saying through this is kids reflecting on what they need you know that self-actualization piece yeah huge where i know the adults that aren't good at this yeah. like 
you know, what, what do I need at this moment to work through this? I mean, that's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Fabulous. And how do I sign up for this? <laughs> uh, on cometcadets.com. Um, Got it. Thanks. It's to all of this content is completely free. Um, the only Got thing it. costs anything is in our shop if you wanted to buy something. But okay. everything cometcadets.com. I'm on my way. Yeah. In for anyone, the little um, logos in here link you directly to the website too. So real easy, real easy to. There are what age bands um, is it designed for? Oh, I, the because of the imaginative piece of it, it's really mm -hmm. like K five. Um, okay, I think second third is that real sweet spot. Second second grade is like really sweet, which is what 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 we've found so far with teachers who have done this. Um, but the concepts are like ages one to 99, you know, but it's like everybody could benefit from the concept, but the imaginative part is a little younger. Awesome. Thank okay, you. I'll stop here. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. So, um, yeah. Other comments for people? Any, any... I was just going to say, so. I know, sir, you know, I signed up for this a while back and we've been like sick and all sorts of stuff and have not had a chance to try it. But this has lit a fire under my bottom because I'm like, this is so awesome. Thank I was excited you. when I was exploring it, but like just actually taking a moment to look at it. It's awesome. I cannot wait. And like my husband and I were talking about this, about how like little kids, right? Like conflict is so much. And I just don't feel like either of my boys at preschool or in kindergarten are really getting the social emotional. I just think we really fail on that a lot in America. And so I'm like, I'm really excited to go through this. With Thank you. Yeah. We're awesome we have a million and a half things that we're still developing. So it's, <laughs> it's new, it's growing, but you can expect a lot more to be on it. Mm. Okay. <laughs> we're going to check it out this weekend. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Okay. So, um, so Christy Walker, you volunteered to go next, right? Yeah, I just need to be able to share my screen. So I just need to find you on the list here and got it. So, uh, make you co-host and there you go. You should be able to share. Mm, not yet. Really? Did I, uh, did I? Okay, so what did I do wrong? Um, oh, hmm. I did not make you. By the way, it says Renton. Are you from Renton Academy? No, but we actually share a campus with them. Ah, okay. They have All a right. fabulous program there. Because because uh, Michelle, uh, both Tammy and I know Michelle pretty well from Rent from Renton Academy. Ah, okay. Okay. So is your superintendent Dr. Damien Patnow? Yes. Fun yeah, we share Damien. we share a principal with Clinton Academy. Uh, Travis Hall is the principal. Okay, he is one of my all-time favorite people. Damien he's Tyler. amazing. He's amazing. He grew up there, and he like yes. he's one of the youngest superintendents in the state. And you know, I love listening uh, to people talk about him because they're like, you know, he didn't change when he became superintendent. He's just a good, good, good <laughs> person. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I had Pat a fan girl there for a minute. Fun ah, fact, Mr. Patton-Odd was my um, vice principal in high school. You must have gone to Hazen. I was a Hazen, yep. Okay, and Sarah, was he as amazing as I think he is? He was incredible, yeah. He just, uh, okay. Why is it not <laughs> letting me share? Thanks for letting me just go. Thanks. <laughs> Once upon a time. Um, so I teach many things that are little uh, ALE program. Um, and this year I have, among other things, a class is a current events class. And I have my middle school current events class. Unfortunately, only one hour a week because it's never enough. Um, and I have pretty free reign to cover what I want to. But I try and do uh, about a third media studies, um, a third topics that pop up in the news a lot and then a third news um, or maybe a quarter a quarter and a half something like that um so that they have the background to understand some of what we're discussing um and then obviously the media studies are incredibly important because there is 
so much disinformation and misinformation. And of course, with chat, G uh, chat GPT and AI, um, it got that much harder, that much easier to create fakes. Um, and so that's something that we talk a lot about. But one thing that I realized before Christmas and before I'd even signed up for this class was that I didn't really have, we could discuss people who loudly say information that is verifiably incorrect, but I didn't know what to tell them about how to handle that other than, you know, well, this is how we fact check sources and, you know, this is where we can find evidence-based answers to questions. Um, and so this class actually came at a really good time because I was trying to figure out how to address that with them um, with this election season coming up. So I ended up with uh, what I call, but they're wrong because uh, it's exactly what one of the kids would say. Um, and really what I was looking at um, with this was addressing this concept with them of not only people's reasons for addressing it, for, um, for spreading dis and misinformation, because that's what we've done, but um, what the thought is behind when somebody gets grounded in that cognitive dissonance, gets grounded in, um, you know, it doesn't matter what I see, I'm gonna believe what I believe. And uh, I think some of that, what, what I realized in this class is some of that came down to helping them understand where people are coming from. So we know, I you know, started off with, okay, we already know um, these different things that we've covered in our, our media studies so far this year. What the, uh, I'm trying to think there is. Um, and so then of course the kids don't wanna know, well, but they're wrong. You know, we can tell them all this, but they're still wrong and they, they won't deny it. They won't change their opinions. And so I wanted to talk to them about collective illusions. And I'm glad that the class is like, kind of a framework for how to explain it. Um, and I really, it's designed for a teacher to lead them through it, but just giving them the basics of what collective illusions are. And usually as I um, go through stuff like this in class, I give them real life examples. I give them metaphors. Um, I elicit connections from them for where, where they've noticed it in their own lives. Um, and so this would probably easily take a whole class period just because I really want to dig into helping them make connections to where they see these things in their own lives. Um, and once we go through this idea of what a collective illusion is, then we can go into what is actually happening physiologically and mentally with people who are stuck in these collective illusions or collective delusions. Um, and again, it's just walking them through the facts that they, you know, may not have understood about stress responses and about people's needs to belong to a group. So it's a little bit psychology and sociology there. Um, and again, I'm hoping that if they can learn to, instead of looking at it as this person so dumb, they keep saying wrong things, to start addressing it from a perspective of, where is the fear in this coming? What is causing the person to cling on to this? And what do I need to understand about the person in order to understand their views? Um, and then I just dumped into some of the, okay, what is it like when people are doing these things? And then again, like we talked about in class, the different things they can do. And obviously we'd have to do some separate stuff on motivational interviewing and nonviolent communication but a lot of it is social emotional stuff that we've already covered, that they've already covered in their various social emotional lessons um, in their, their kind of homeroom class, I guess. And, um, and that these would be good techniques to practice and that they need to, as they're encountering this in the uh, future with dis and, dis and misinformation and people who get stuck in their beliefs, um, that they can use some of these strategies rather than just try to argue facts. And that if they're going to really try and meet that with a point, meet what they're come, meet these collective illusions, I guess, um, from a point of hoping to change someone's mind, that they need to understand more than understanding the facts, they need to understand what they're talking about. So that's it in a nutshell.
Mitch, I think you're like, talking about the like so Right, right. I was, I was muted. First of all, I said, wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, that didn't come through. But uh, yeah, just wow. And then it, so we have this, um, you know, countrywide, probably even worldwide, you know, the thing about, oh, we'll just teach media literacy or we'll just teach misinformation by showing the kids how to research stuff. But what you've really done is in the language that's really kid friendly, going in, getting them to become engaged in the reasons these things exist and how to recognize them and how to want to do the research or the uh the exploration in order to find out what's going on and it's just it's marvelous really it's about, it's about connection and i think when i when i go over this with them it's probably not gonna be till after we're done with our midwinter break but when i go over it with them um it's gonna be from a standpoint of let's connect rather than disconnect and mm -hmm. i think it is really important for them because if they're approaching an adult say a family member or someone at you know, a coach, someone at church, whatever, and they're they're saying, hey, I learned something different, they're always going to be, there's always going to be that power imbalance between the adult and the kid. And so if they can go in with the, with the understanding and the questioning rather than the, you know, I'm a bratty teenager and mm. so of course I know best, <laughs> then, uh, then they might have a better chance of being taken serious. And it really incredible. It can make, make such a difference. Um, you know, I hope uh, hope you get a, you really get a chance to use it. And again, if when you use it, if you, I'd, I'd love to find out how it went. And yeah. I would suspect that the other people in this class also would uh, would find benefit for their kids as, as as well. Yeah. No, I'll give feedback. I'm looking forward to teaching this one. Yeah, I, I would like to as well. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you. So, so thank you for volunteering to present also. Um, and I'm looking at the time. So we probably have time for one more presenter. So I'm sure none of you want to be left out, right? Uh, but somebody grab it quick. Anybody? Mitch, sorry, I'm trying. Yep. Okay, uh, Cynthia. Um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. And... Okay, cool. Uh, it blanked on me every time I try to push the stop mute button. It um it blacked out on me. But um, actually, I'm not going to be able to share my slides if you wouldn't mind. I'll just tell you okay. when to go forward. Okay. Okay. So uh, <laughs> yeah, let me. Let me find on heuristics. Okay. Right. And, and let me go so to... I can hear myself. Sorry. And guys, I just want to say I've been super impressed with you guys' presentations and everything you're showing. I'm like, what can I borrow? What can I use? How can I um, push it forward with these students? So for those that don't know, um, my name is Cynthia and I am a behavior specialist right now. At least that's the role I'm acting in. Um, this year for a middle level campus. So um, it's essentially, um, most of you would see it as a middle school, but this West Valley here, we broke it up into two different schools. So we've got the middle school and the junior high. And um, as we're I'm going through this class, I've been thinking about the heavy hitters that I work with and their behaviors. And that's why I took this course. How can I help them change their mindsets um, to focus on school? And as we're going through lesson five, our last um, lesson with Mitch, <clears throat> I was thinking about, because my priority with these students is to, more often than not, I'm a special ed teacher by trade, get them back into class. Oftentimes, these kids are um, doing our task avoidance, our elopement, our um, picking fights or whatnot. And I was really listening into this last lesson about, you know, looking at the um, motivational interviewing because I do talk to them a lot they like to spend their time in my office to not be in class and the nonviolent communication and <clears throat> a lot of the students that I work with have as you can imagine bad home lives and bad situations whether it's a foster system problem or um, 
conflict at home or some sort of loss. So their mind is not here and it doesn't want to be on learning um, or accessing information, even though our, a lot of our discussion is, I know this is a temporary situation as far as school is concerned. Um, I need you to stay in class and help yourself out to get that information in order to learn so that your future does not have to match your present so you can move forward and succeed. And so that last lesson that Mitch, you were talking about, you know, how to get these kids to learn and teach using their full brain really was catching my attention. And, you know, the word that I picked up on was this heuristics. Well, what are they? Because you say in those slides, you know, learning is work. And I tell my students all the time, like the key to success more than anything else is hard work. And every job that I've had that I've been successful in or that, I've, you know, whether I've wanted it or not, the only way... I can accomplish it is through hard work. It's not the school that I have behind me. It's the hard work that I put into it to allow me to be successful. And it's going to be the same for these students or for anybody in life. If you want something, you got to work for it. So that first bullet learning is work. Absolutely. That you have on there, but then you say build heuristic skills. And I'm like, okay, well, what is that? So in my slideshow, I was focused more on like teaching the teachers using these concepts that you're learning, um, because I do, I guess I have not in a classroom, I am working in the office, actually I'm often in the classrooms working with students, but I've also wanted to take on roles of teaching teachers and, you know, try to find ways to motivate them to get to, you know, teach their kids. So um, I put these slideshows of heuristics, what are they, because I had no idea, and how to build them, as Mitch was telling us, so slide. So, um, you know, just did the definition of heuristics are mental shortcuts that help people make decisions more effectively, and they are valuable in quick decision making and problem solving. And I was like, oh, okay, um, that at least helps give me a definition because looking at that word, I was like, you kept saying it, Mitch, and I don't know what you're saying. This gave me an idea to go, okay, got you. I know what they are now. Um, <clears throat> and I did hear you say, you know, that we increased our heuristic skills with that plus or minus five thought conscious thoughts. So it's like, okay, how do we build this? So if you'll go to the next slide, letting the teachers know that, you know, we use this every day. There's benefits of these heuristics. It will help these kids solve their problems faster, whether it's math problems or um, our day-to-day -day quick choices that we have. And as you were saying, um, how do we make them more of a norm so that they can access them quickly? So slide. There are disadvantages to heuristics, and it's something we talked about on your earlier classes with the cognitive bias and those judgments that we have. Um, and it's something I just wanted to make the educators aware of that this can become a disadvantage, but that's not what we're focusing today. It's just something I wanted to bring to their attention that um, because we've talked about it, and honestly, it is something I do battle with some of my students, this cognitive bias um, that they're bringing into my office. But that makes it an awareness for me. And I wanted to help myself understand that this is part of what we're working with here. So bring it to the educator's um, awareness that, that this can be a hindrance or something that we lean into. But if we're aware of it, we can balance against that. Slide. <clears throat> so here I listed the different types of heuristics because again, it was not something I was fully aware of. And I was like, oh, like, I can't build something if I'm not overly familiar with it and how to make it work. So here are the, um, what's this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different forms of heuristics that if you read through them, you're like, oh yes, I know these things. These are things that happen every day, like availability. Uh, <clears throat> I know that um, when I'm looking at something, so people make a choice based on the idea of how quickly they can think of something they can attach to it. Like, am I gonna fly going to New England this summer? You know. Am I going to drive or fly? And some people are like, well, I'm not going to fly because, you know, planes are dangerous because they just heard of an accident recently. <clears throat> and that could definitely drive their force to making a decision, a quick decision based on maybe they watched the news the night before. And it's not an accurate statement of fact. Flight planes are obviously quite safe. But because they listened to it the night before, that's going to be what's in their mind quickly and if, uh, first. And so they might go directly in that decision which is something we need to, as educators, be aware of with our students. 
we're not always familiar with what's going on in their lives. We're not always familiar what with what they're um, <clears throat> listening to necessarily. Um, chances are they're probably not watching the news. But I am seeing in my interactions with these middle school age kids that oftentimes they're going to blurt something out, even an answer to a simple question it could be a no or something with that availability, what's in their mind first. And then if they pause for a second and think they might have a different response. But as teachers, we need to be aware of that, that that is playing a part in our students and their interaction, that they're going to, especially at this grade level, these three grade levels, give us an instant response and we need to give them some pause and wait time. And that's something I would discuss with the educators. Like understand the first answer is probably not going to be the one that they want to go with. Same thing with familiarity. If you know somebody that's done something and has experience with it, then that's going to lead people towards that. Oh, I'm going to use this um, car company because my uncle drives that car and I know it's really great. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, I'm going to represent representativeness. Ooh, that's a big word. Um, I'm going to choose this because grandma likes it and I know grandma likes it. So I'm going to do it. And I like grandma. So these are things that are going to affect our students um, in their thought process, especially I think about this when it goes to like their um, the papers that they're going to write or the topics that they're going to choose. We can lean into it, understanding where they're coming from, knowing that um, this is the heuristics that's playing a part in their life. Um, then you've got the effect. So what am I feeling at that moment? Again, we're working with middle schoolers. So um, if I'm in a history class, they're not going to necessarily attach themselves to those the concepts like legislative and executive branches. Sorry, I've been in a um, social studies class the last couple of days for eighth graders, but they're going to go with what they're feeling and we need to work with those feelings as much as possible. Um, then heuristics, uh, another version is anchoring. So they're going to make their choices based on the first information they're here. Well, hello, middle school. Yep. That's going to be it alone. And, and teachers need to be aware that that's what you say is important in the way you say it and present it because they're going to come back at you <clears throat> and, you know, they might shut down right after that. And they're going to grab that first thing they heard out of your mouth. Um, people also make choices based on the scarcity. I mean, my goodness, do we not see that every day with the supply and demand idea and sales because we're not going to see this. And of course, trial and error. So that is the effective way to go about it. Trial and error. People try different things to see what works. That is where our students probably struggle the most right now, at least at our grade level. I know as we get to the upper grades, they um, their brains are developing more, so they're more willing to do the trial and error. But this is where we really need to reach our students at, at um, especially this middle level grades, is that it is okay to do trial and error, but kids this age are so impatient and they don't want to try and see what works. But we need to definitely sell it to them that it, if you give it a shot and you fail or mess up or make a mistake, which all kids are afraid to do, um, that's okay. Try again and see what you what comes out and then you'll be more experienced in that. And I think that's one thing that we should probably sell to our teachers is we already, as educators say, everybody makes mistakes, it's okay. But I would maybe adjust it a little bit and say, it's not just the mistake that's happening, it's the experience of the mistake. You are getting an experience. You're experiencing life, you're experiencing even let's go with everybody's least favorite subject, sometimes math, um, you're making that mistake, but it's the experience of doing it this way that's letting you see, oh, that way is not effective for this problem or whatever it is. So um, <clears throat> rephrasing some of our ideas as it is to tap into this heuristics of trial and error is very effective and it's it's not a bad thing. It's just showing you other options, I guess, as a way that I would go about selling that one as a teacher to my students. Slide. So why this matters? As Mitch showed us, people, students, can only hold and manipulate about three to seven thoughts at any given time. Um, that's why people say, if you want to sell something to somebody, say it about seven times so that it really walks in there. <clears throat> because of this, we need to build their heuristic skills so that those, um, so they're not focused on them, that all their cognitive abilities aren't thinking about some of these quick bits of information that we want them to have. Um, <clears throat> and how do we do that? Next slide, please. Well, there are 
five different ways, as Mitch has showed us. So I was grabbing your lesson on this one, Mitch, and um, using it to, again, present to the instructor to say, so how do we build this and increase this so that kids, and when I think about this the most, I think about um, math facts, like multiplication tables, you know, that's definitely something that would be bouncing into the heuristics that if I just have my math facts done, which how many of our eighth graders aren't as solid as we'd like them to be on their math facts, then that won't take up so much of their cognitive space when it comes to doing pre their pre-algebra or algebra problems. I'm not going to sit here and stress about six times three or pull out the calculator, which is happening now more often than not. Um, when I'm solving for X, because I already know that portion of it, I can really figure out how to solve this equation otherwise. Um, same thing with like ideas of um, dates and numbers, but that's harder. You're looking more scientific facts when I look at repetition and practice. So you got repetition and practice, as you said, stories, kids and people like listening to stories and I'll go further into these in, in my future slides, but simulations, chunking and very practice, are different ways to build those heuristics. So slide. So as we said, repetition and practice, um, <clears throat> and this happens not just in our math in our school, but we can tie into our students and our kids when we remind them that for those that are athletes, you guys go to practice every day. Let's take soccer and you guys learn how to dribble the fall, ball down the field and it happens over and over again. You're dribbling a ball down the court. You have to do it over and over again to get comfortable with that skill. So you're not thinking about it anymore. You're just doing it. In the school setting, it would be those math facts, as I said, or other bits of information that just make, if I know it without thinking about it, it's one last step that I have to take. It builds that confidence in their skills and the muscle memory that they need to be able to do harder level things in thinking. Slide, please. You also have your stories. Before written word came down, we had oral traditions and we passed on information that way. So humans are just automatically ingrained to hear stories, listen to stories, and tap into those stories as ways to learn. Now, not always do students understand that they're learning as they're listening, but they are taking it in, it holds them, it catches them, and it gives them that something to hold on to. And then <clears throat> if we can help them create their own stories and tie something in, then they're going to keep those connections a little harder. I'm thinking about the, um, the social studies classes, those language arts classes where they're writing hopefully reflecting. I know that's a big um, topic of conversation across our boards as I'm listening to all your guys' lessons as well. And I do see the importance and I know it myself and I'm trying to get these students to understand it. If we just reflect on our thoughts, our feelings, what's going on in our lives, it takes us, you know, it makes us pause and step back and look at what's really going on and maybe seeing it from a different angle. So I like the stories concept because I think Right now, again, I'm going to focus on middle school. These kids get so tied up on what's happening right in front of them that they just need to pause and step back. And if they can put it on paper or Chromebook um, in a story format, they might be able to approach things differently. All right, next slide. Simulations. Um, I like this one as a learning method because, you know, of course, kids are tapped into games. I'm looking at that. I already did pull up the Comet Cadet. Loving that. Um, and science, research is showing that kids do learn through games, which when I went back to get my degree on this, I was like, what? You want me to play games for kids to learn? And my head was not wrapped around that, but I'm getting there. I'm slowly learning that it does work and it makes it fun. Not my strength with my students, but trying. But what I like about simulations is <clears throat> it allows kids to manipulate what's going on. So whether they're living through the moment of it and like trying to decide what to happen with, with what's going on in their life, if they can step back and put it down, say on a board game or another situation where they can try, well, let me try it. I think of those books, choose your own adventure, right? Let me try this route. Is this going to work? Oh, nope. I died. Go back and try it again. Those kind of simulations help kids process and look at it and go, oh, okay. I know my normal response. Again, I'm thinking about my behavior students is to handle it this way. What if I were to step back, and try this different route. And that's where stimulations help. And if we can get kids, again, I'm gonna to look towards my behavior students to practice those simulations. Well, my normal response when I get pissed off is to walk out of the classroom. Oh, what would happen if I were to maybe take a breath and practice and practice, then they um, they might, hopefully it'll take time. I know Mitch, you've talked to me about this. Change takes time. 
um, find that different approach and really reach towards that one. And that becomes more of their automatic, that heuristic skill to go to versus their current of I'm just going to pop out of here or I'm going to say blurt some words that I really shouldn't, which are going to get me in trouble. Slide. Chunking, this is a big one. I know all you educators know this one very well, um, especially as a SPED. This is something we work on um, quite regularly with our scaffolding is how do I chunk information? And it's something I think teachers today are just are starting to do anyway. But of course, that the most common one I think we go with is that nine digit number. Now, kids today probably don't know how to memorize a number to save their lives because they put it in their phone and they never see it again. But those of us that are in our <clears throat> 40s and above, spend our childhood memorizing cell phone or our house phones and whatnot. And uh, and yes, we, we had our methods. And so it was teaching the kids how to chunk that information so that and, they and can maybe, maintain and it. And maybe the kids need to memorize their parents' credit card numbers, right? That That's that's something they can yep, touch back yeah. into. Hey, guys, <laughs> here's some information you might need to know. Uh, your address, you know. Don't tell me just to go this direction. <laughs> Memorize your address. Memorize your parents' cell phone so that you don't have to have your cell phone. They can call it from the office. Things like that. Right, exactly. To help them retain that information that they can quickly um, grasp when they need to. Slide. And then the very practice, as uh, <clears throat> Mitch was saying, uh, and it's true, you start doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to get bored. And our students today, especially with their instant gratification, get bored so easily. And I tell my littles, so, you know, we watch a lot of Bluey. It's okay to be bored sometimes. But when we want them to learn it, presenting it in different ways is going to help them grasp it and use it and see it and, and realize that they can use this information in different arenas. And so whether we're, you know, in a language arts class or a history class, and I am seeing this when I'm in the history classes, you know, they've got their textbook that they're looking through. But then, of course, they're going to toss in the, the YouTube video that might grab the kid's attention. Or I remember when I was in school watching Glory to try to attach myself to the, the um, Civil War, you know, things that we can't often see. But if we put it in a different format, maybe we can relate to it there. Well, when things are being presented to us in different ways or we're using it in different ways, then again, it's going to get more um, locked into our, not just our short-term memory, which is what we're trying to push past with all these heuristics, but we want to push it into our working so it's always accessible and long-term memory so that it's quickly access accessible. And that's where that very practice comes in is showing kids different methods and ways to learn and use these skills so that it carries forward. And I know at least when I was in the classroom teaching, that was something we talked about a lot. Okay, so yes, you've got a math class, but how are you gonna integrate uh, language arts or science into this? And to show them, okay, well, this skill you can use here and here and here. So let's use it here, here and here so that you can see how broadly um, think about math facts, you're gonna use it in science and whatnot. So if we can memorize our multiplication tables, it's all going to help you in math, but it'll also help you in science and other areas as well. And OK, so if you don't want to just go into the very practice, now you're seeing where it can be used in other areas. But if you don't want to just sit there, rote memorization it, let's use some manipulatives to help you out. So there you go, getting that hands on practice to lock it in. Slide. And then in conclusion, um, these heuristics allows these kids to make decisions and learn easier because they've got those mental shortcuts. It's stuff that we've had that um, I know they want to use. Kids want shortcuts as it is. Um, one thing is it's going to take some work and we need to be aware of that and, and definitely push that to our students. Yes, all these things take work, but once you put in some of this work, then it comes a lot easier further down the road when things are going to get harder for you anyway. And I, for me, that's kind of the bottom line is, yep, we're putting in some of this hard labor in now. My brain continuously goes to that multiplication table because, yep, I did um, co-taught math for years and I would see our kids struggle because they're focusing so hard on, we were doing pre-algebra, but they're doing their multiplication tables with a, um, they're not using those fast facts they are looking for the answers on a multiplication table, which is taking up that much more time to do the problem, which is the pre-algebra problem that's in front of them. So if we can build these heuristics, ensure that they're getting these things memorized, it's just gonna help them out in the future to do harder complex things. 
And when it comes to life skills, some of those heuristics around life are going to be like, oh yeah, I already know this. I know those quick decisions. I know that through trial and error, this A works for me, B doesn't. A is going to probably help me succeed. I'm going to go down A's path. So that's my thought process in building this slideshow and who I would present it to. Again, mostly I would be presenting to educators more than the students themselves and helping them look and see how to help their students learn. I have to say your passion comes so through. It's so awesome. And one of the things that, um, that I most like of all the different things that happened to me is seeing a person take some basic ideas from me and go so much farther than I ever could have. And you've really done that with this presentation. Uh, thank you. Great, great work. Thanks. Oh, yes. You're welcome to share. Anybody can have this one and share it. And I'll be honest, I'm going to be borrowing a lot of your guys' stuff. So thank you. So other other comments? Yeah, fantastic. So um so it's now well where you are, <laughs> um, you know, five forty. So we're ten minutes past. Um so uh but I have to say these lessons that you all have shared, um, it you know, my heart is like like jumping out of my chest it's like these were these were fantastic i learned from every one of you so so thank you and um let's see somebody um so any last um any last thoughts before basically you before you graduate <laughs> No. I want to say that I truly enjoyed this class. All the um the presentations today were amazing. Um I've actually used a lot of the knowledge that I've learned already in a lot of my classes. <laughs> um I teach Spanish in an academic support class, but um I feel like I've been using it a lot on a daily basis lately. Mm -hmm. Um so I really enjoyed it. Wow. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, I, you know, you all have my email. So as you try these things, if things, first of all, if things really work, I would love to hear. Um, and if things, if you run into questions, um, you know, that's what I'm here for also. So feel free to, you know, to reach out and say, you know, Mitch, I tried this. It didn't seem to work. Do you have any ideas about this? And maybe, you know, maybe I'll have an idea. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help. I'm going to turn off the recording.